Mr. President, it is with a great pleasure that we welcome you and Mrs. Hillary Clinton with your entire delegation to Rwanda. Your visit gives us a rare opportunity to thank you personally, the government and the people of the United States for your commitment to helping our people overcome the ravages of genocide. Your decision, Mr. President, to visit Rwanda is an eloquent statement of your condemnation of genocide. <laughs> a show of solidarity with the victims and a challenge to the international community to work together to stem the recurrence of genocide. <laughs> Mr. President, Rwanda as a nation was not built by colonialists. They found it wide, stable, prosperous, and homogeneous. Pre-colonial groups that exist in this country had no geographical separation. They neither had racial nor class connotations. They certainly did not underlie any power relations. Genocide, therefore, was not a product of centuries-old ethnic hatred as it is often assumed. The ideology that led to genocide was planted in our society in the early part, part of the 20th century when the 7th century old Rwanda was conquered by the Europeans. It was based on contemporary European racist theories. Discriminatory policies were applied to all walks of life. The divided nation could not put up any form of resistance, and the Rwandan people became subservient. In 1962, Rwanda gained independence under the shadow of the 1959 genocide orchestrated by the colonial authorities. The ideology was handed down to the post-colonial regimes which persistently carried out mass killings, exclusion, and discrimination against the Tutsi. Therefore, the 1994 events in which over one million Rwandans perished was a continuation of a long chain of atrocities. All this was done under the guise of defending noble ideals such as democracy, republicanism, and freedom of worship. This misled the international community with regard to the genocidal nature of the regimes that ruled Rwanda, and this encouraged the culture of impunity. It became so deeply entrenched that the authorities were not shy to perpetrate genocide in broad daylight, over radio waves, and in front of international television cameras. The Rwandese Patriotic Front put an end to the genocide. Subsequently, an all-inclusive government of national unity and transitional assembly were set up to address issues of national reconstruction and reconciliation. The government of national unity has concentrated on rebuilding the nation by correcting the distortions created in the past and mobilizing the Rwandan people for unity. The government has embarked on an active program to reintegrate new and old returnees as well as the survivors of the 1994 genocide. All these are deliberate measures meant to gradually stabilize our society. 
Unfortunately, genocidal killings continue in eastern part of Rwanda and in the region. The genocide ideology is being disseminated by those who committed atrocities against the Rwandan people. Its ideologues are ensconced in foreign capitals. They are using modern communication facilities to spread the venomous ideology. This is why it is imperative for all of us to work together to promote an international strategy to combat genocide. Mr. President, the act of reversing the tragic history was basically a defense of fundamental rights. It is a way of laying a firm foundation for democracy and good governance. In this, we believe we share common values. In dealing with, with the difficult problems resulting from genocide, the people of Rwanda have demonstrated the ability to transcend the negative tendencies, to work for national unity, and they have been our primary resource. We shall continue to mobilize the population at all levels of society, particularly at the grassroots. Mr. President, despite the great achievements by the Rwandan people in the last three years, there are critical areas where we still need international support and understanding. First, our post-genocide society is fragile, and therefore, Rwanda should be treated, treated as a special case. <laughs> the international community sh should take cognizance of this fact when assisting us or judging our achievements. Second, we believe justice is the basis for imparting and defending our shared values. We believe justice is a basis for eradicating impunity. We believe justice is imperative for the stability of our society. Yet, the ring leaders who masterminded the 1994 genocide and who are, who are the principal culprits are out of reach of our, of our courts and indeed those of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Third, we need to develop our human resources. Through education, the society will change its values. It will shed the negative tendencies that led to genocide and adopt positive ways of resolving national problems. In acquiring knowledge through education and skills, we shall be better equipped to get out of the underdevelopment and thus alleviate poverty. Mr. President, exactly 50 years ago, the United States of America helped the world get over the aftermath of genocide and war. At the same time, the world dedicated itself to upholding fundamental rights and to avoid to avoid falling prey to similar atrocities. This message was ignored by those who were in charge of Africa at that time. That's why apartheid flourished in South Africa and genocide thrived in Rwanda. Today, Africa is awakening and the African people are demanding the upholding of fundamental rights. At the same time, the United States is proposing a new partnership with Africa. The confluence of these two currents, Oga well for the continent, and we believe will create new perspective and a new beginning for Africa.
Your presence in Africa, your presence in Rwanda today, Mr. President, is equally a representation of this new hope for the African people. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to present to you President Clinton, and now, Mr. President, I invite you to address the Rwandan people. I thank you very much.